future. Welcome aboard the journey as we commence our month of activities with a dynamic panel discussion focused on a resilient community with energy at the center. Joining us will be Kim Griffith Tang Hao. Angela Rainford Professor Chandrabran Sharma and our moderator Davia Chambers But first, a few opening remarks from the head of the CARICOM Energy Unit Dr. Devon Gardner. Thinking of where we are coming from over the past decade and where we are going to be going within the next decade is interesting where sustainable energy is concerned. In 2010, we had roughly around 6% renewable energy penetration aggregate across CARICOM member states. In 2020, we have around 12.3% renewable energy um, implemented across member states. Um, when you look at aggregated numbers. And if we are to be successful in our targets for 2027, as we have set them out um, when we agreed uh, uh, on those targets in 2013 among energy ministers, we would be somewhere around 48% by 2030. So we are talking about a situation where we have doubled the renewable energy penetration in the last decade, and we are now ambitiously talking about quadrupling what we want to reach from where we are now. And while we are doing that, the characteristics of our energy system are becoming more complex from one day to the next. We were talking years ago in 2010 and there about when we were looking at how our energy system should be architectured. We were talking a lot about um, clean energy. We we're talking a lot about reliability. We are talking a lot about affordability. And those were the things which would have dominated the conversation during those times. As we fast forward to 2020, a decade later, the conversation continues to center around clean. And of course, we have shifted the reliability conversation to much more than just that. And we are talking a lot more about flexibility in order for us to be able to adapt to a number of situations. We're talking more about security, recognizing that oil, which is where many of our energy systems are dependent on, uh, is becoming a lot more volatile. We're talking about security a lot more. And more importantly, we are talking about resilience. And in the context of resilience, resilience isn't just singular, but rather multi hazard resilience. And that is really a lot of what is dominating the discussions. And even in the midst of all of that, the issue of cost, affordability, still remains central. Ladies and gentlemen, we expect that uh, you know our experts within this panel will give us some good guidance. We have experts who are policy and regulations related from the electric utility. We have technology um, experts and we have experts in financing. And we are talking about persons who have been able to implement um, what it is that they will be talking about. And because at the end of the day, for us to reach our goals and targets of sustainable energy within the region, we must ensure that the policy and regulatory environment that is necessary for those who operate our energy systems, our electric utilities, our marketing and distributing companies for fuels, and other new energy operators in the emerging energy business paradigm are supported and given the kind of environment that is predictable um, and for them to really make favorable returns. And of course, for consumers, to be able to afford the energy services that have been provided and of the right quality. And of course, for all of that to happen, the financing is necessary. How is it we're going to pay for it? And what is it that can be paid for through public investments as well as private capital? And then of course, you know, what will the technology look like? Um, how can the technology ensure that we are able to affordably and sustainably provide the kind of resilient energy future that we desire? a resilient energy future that will allow all CARICOM citizens to be able to afford and access energy um, in a way that makes their societies much more resilient. I thank you very much for the attention to today's session. Thank you very much, Dr. Gardner. 
I'll now invite each panelist to share an overview of the role of policy and regulations, finance, technology, in supporting a resilient community, of course, with energy at the center. Ms. Kim Griffith, Tanghao. I wish to thank first the CARICOM Secretary and particularly um, Dr. Devin Gardner for inviting me to be including in this panel discussion with this group of esteemed colleagues as we celebrate CARICOM Energy Month. So for us in Barbados, even with the challenges that we've had this year and to a degree the hardship this year that has been pre presented as a result of the pandemic worldwide, I think this year has brought for us into even sharper focus our need to continue to chart our own paths towards energy independence and energy security. In Barbados, we have a national energy policy that sets our ambitious targets of 100% reliance on renewable energy by 2030. And on the island, we have um, current installed capacity of about 170 megawatts. Currently, 50 megawatts of solar um, is installed of that 170 megawatts. We have 10 megawatts of utility owned solar and 40 megawatts of customer owned distributed systems. So I really wanted to use this overview to just give you um, a, a status of the, of the current state of play here um, in Barbados. So we have a new energy minister, Sir, um, the Honorable Kerry Simmons, and he has already demonstrated a keenness to ensure that he's aware of the emerging issues towards plotting a path to 100% renewable by 2030. I think we can all um, agree that's quite an ambitious target, and he seems quite committed to working through um, that with key stakeholders, and I think that's that's incredible incredibly important. And the last thing I want to add before I hand back over to the other panelists is that the utility as well is turning up and more recently we've applied for permission to launch our integrated utility service model pilot and that's something that we are partnering with CARICOM to do and it's effectively facilitating customers through an on-bill financing program where the utility will provide upfront funding for customers to install um, energy efficiency and renewable energy equipment and devices and, and over time they will be able to pay back um, for that equipment via their bills. So it's been quite a busy time for us but certainly an exciting time and, and, and again thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with all of you. Thank you Ms. Kim Griffith Tanghao. Our second speaker is focusing on finance and she is Angela Rainford. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm very pleased to be part of this esteemed panel. Um, I guess just from my perspective in terms of financing, so there's been quite a bit of changes in the industry since I started. Um, I started looking at renewable energy back in 2012, um, really in Jamaica and increasingly looking at some of the other island markets. I think what's changed is there's a certain degree of sophistication that now exists in the market not only with um, equity capital, but also on the commercial banking side. And that varies according to each island, but it's really has been quite a change from where it began back in 2012, 2013, where just the very concept of renewable energy and financing renewable energy projects was very, very foreign at that point in time. And there was eff effectively a lot of handholding that needed to be done with potential investors. I have two companies. The first company, Recamnir, is focused on utility scale um, installations, and we were successful in building a 51 megawatt peak um, solar power plant in Jamaica. I think one of the things that we're most proud of is the fact that we were able to do that at a tariff rate of eight and a half US cents per kilowatt hour, which up until that point of time, if you think about the retail prices that we have in the Caribbean market, um, was unheard of. Um, and there was also a lot of doubt, I think, at that point in time that we would even be able to deliver the project at that price. Um, I'm very pleased to say that that plant was commissioned June 2019. It's currently operational. And we also had an interesting mix of, of investors in that project. So I partnered with a strategic pro uh, company out of France, which provided around 50% of the capital. And then the other 50% I syndicated across a range of investors. One was a German private equity fund. But what I'm most proud of is also that we have a local pension fund investor in that project. And that for me is, was a game changer as well to say and signal to the industry that we as, you know, as Caribbean people, we can invest and own our own infrastructure. And we can also be a part of that, that story which is unfolding in our various markets. 
it's the opportunity is possible in some countries in the Caribbean, but there are other countries which are a bit behind. And when I say behind, it's in terms of that vision on the regulatory front. And a financier can only, we can only operate within the rules of the game. And the rules of the game is set by the policymakers. And that was one of the key changes that Jamaica um, made in 2012, which enabled the investments not only by ourselves, but whether it's through Wigton, which is a public private, uh, a public entity, um, and then also WRB and BMR, there are other IPPs in the market. And so creating that regulatory framework is really important. And that would be one of the key messages I would give to any market um, across the Caribbean region to encourage investment. Um, lastly, I don't want, I think there are going to be a lot more questions asked. So I'm going to pause here. But the last thing I would add is that that rule of contract and rule of law and transparency should never be underestimated. I think if, if, if a country would like to encourage the right type of investors, and by right type, I mean honest, with integrity, and looking for not just to take returns from the country, but also looking for a sustainable way to benefit the country and themselves as investors with their return, that that corporate governance and transparency is super important. So thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Ms. Rainford. Now our last speaker is focusing on a technology and he is Professor Chandraban Sharma. The develop development state of a country and its human development index are linked with energy use. Electricity is the top of the energy chain. Therefore, all electricity suppliers and users desire a more resilient grid. There are seven areas which I see that you can use to improve resilience. Firstly, utilizing appropriate renewable energy technologies and storage solutions, and in some cases, pairing those with fossil fuels will not only enhance the resilience of a system through fuel diversification, but will also reduce emissions associated with fossil fuel consumption. Two, distributed en energy generation and microgrids are also very important. Decentralizing energy sources is a technique used to enhance power system resilience. Three, integrating storage into the electrical system can help smooth variations in the renewable energy sources like wind and photovoltaics. Electric vehicles can provide dual benefits in that they can reduce transportation, carbon dioxide output footprints, as well as providing battery backup via vehicle to grid systems. These three form a good segue into four, which would be smart grids and advanced metering infrastructure. Smart grids can bring about the technical solutions that are highlighted in the first three above and a more resilient electricity system. Five, relocating or fortif fortifying vulnerable assets, such as relocating assets above flood levels and away from potential high risk areas that are at risk from high winds or the, that serve the most critical facilities, example, medical centers or emergency shelters. Six, the modification of, of consumer energy use through education and behavior change, energy efficiency measures, financing incentives such as utility tariff restructuring and improved energy efficient building codes can support a more resilient power system. And last, and no, by no means least, portable water security. Most forget this as an issue after a disaster. Renewable energy systems can be set up to also provide ample portable water via reverse osmosis or any other technologically applicable system for that particular location. I believe that if we focus on these seven, we can have and develop a reliable, resilient system, a power system for the future. I thank you. More from our discussion after this message from Gary Jackson of the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, SECRE. The Caribbean community celebrates Energy Month every November, every year. And this is just to bring focus to energy um, in our minds, to make it the forefront of our minds. Energy is such a critical part of our lives. 
um, but sometimes we take it for granted. I mean, the UN has posted 940 million persons without energy. In the CARICOM itself, 9 million persons are without electricity. Um, that is almost half of the population of CARICOM member states, which is significant. So you understand how small we are. We have to find ways to work together in a coordinated and collective way. All hands on deck. So from here on, for us, it's about teamwork. From here on on, it's about transformation. And transforming this energy landscape to one that is climate resilient, one that is sustainable, affordable, improving the lives of our people. So I'll leave you with this, a resilient community, energy at the center of our lives. Thank you. Now back to the discussion. We'll start with what the current state of the energy systems within the region and what has extreme weather events such as the 2017 hurricanes and of course more recently the pandemic highlighted about their vulnerabilities. Um, Professor Sharma, what have been the major infrastructure and operational failures for electric grids, grids rather in particular and how were customers impacted? Well, the first issue that you have with the current electric grid infrastructure is that they are based on a kind of web radial flow design, meaning that the power system or the power station is at a center location and then the lines radiate mostly overhead to locations. So what we would have, what happened is that either the, if the power system goes down because of extreme weather, hurricane, or the line which is actually delivering the power to the consumers go down, then you have a total power failure that will cascade through the whole system. The other issue that you have, and which I believe uh, we need to look at, is the concentration of knowledge in the region. What has happened if you look at that in 2017, when, this, when many of the islands were subjected to these intense uh, storms, the, when their system went down, they needed help. And most of the help in terms of getting people across there came from a utility when in fact what we probably should be developing and that utility is stay in tech what we probably should be developing is a regional response for this this kind of thing so that when something happens the, the region center which let's call it a caricom center probably could be the one which actually com, uh, controls and coordinates the disaster uh, for uh, preparedness and disaster uh, recovery so that we everyone knows where you can get uh, devices you can where you can get lines where you can get transformers where you can get the tech the techniques and the, and the technical competence to bring back your system back on online as for the consumer well once the line goes down you are out of out of power for weeks and if you remember the, the 2017 one uh, uh, the system, many of the systems were down for minimum two weeks. The, the people with no power, no water, uh, no refrigeration, uh, hospitals were running on their diesel generators if they had those. So these are the main issues that you see really is the hub structure. And the last issue which I think we should look at too is that there is a variation in, in, in technical competence throughout the islands. And one of the issues that come up there all the time is, in my opinion, being the leader of the energy system group, is that you find that many a time that we rely a lot on people extra region to advise us. Nothing by that, that by itself is wrong. What I'm saying is that we should have within our CARICOM region, a group of, of people where we go to, and they're the ones who help us to decide in terms of what is the next step forward. It may be just going back to the same group and, and uh, of external advisors and getting information, but at least we have a group who can uh, filter those uh, um, recommendations and ensure that the CARICOM country gets the best for the buck. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sharma, for those valid points. And Ms. Rainford, how have these issues, the extreme weather events of 2017 and the pandemic, affected the capital markets regionally and globally? And have they changed the risk profile for investments? 
So uh, the, on the only answer is yes. I mean, absolutely. At the end of the day, investors are, are pricing risk. And so if the risk is deemed to be greater, then they will price that in. So I think one of the key impacts is in terms of the cost of capital and the return that investors will be looking for um, on the basis of the risk of a, a category four or five hurricane um, tearing apart your facility. Therefore, they will price that in and say, look, you know, for the Caribbean region versus compared to some other countries or geographies, we're going to have to include a premium to that in the event that such an event takes place. Um, one of the, the second impacts of the, the, the hurricanes and that risk on the capital markets is the, the cost of insurance and, and not just the cost, but even the ability to get insurance. So for whether it's for a solar facility, a wind farm or any of these installations that a developer would want to put in place, um, you're, you're required by our financiers to have a certain level of, of insurance on the facility. And clearly to meet those requirements, either you're gonna have to, you know, you unfortunately have had to pay more or in some cases, it's really unfortunate, but you may not be able to even place that risk in the in the market. Um, so that has an implication for what projects can actually be executed and implemented. The third area in terms of risk profile, which I view is to some degree a positive coming out of um, the question around resilience is, is also what Professor Sharma mentioned in terms of decentralization. So we the, the second company that I founded is called Seleco and our target is basically just that, is to do distributed power um, projects on behalf of clients who would like to invest in a solar installation or battery storage for on-site generation, but they may not necessarily have the capital themselves to do that. So what we are enabling is we will basically do the development for them. We will assist them with that technical expertise to put the projects together and the feasibility of those projects. And also we will finance those installations um, to, to enable them to make that, that next step. Because um, sometimes the, the capital that, that an institution or industrial has, you want to use that for your core business, not necessarily for an energy installation, um, which clearly feeds through your core business, but isn't necessarily part of your overall main strategy. So that is something we are looking at. And I think that's an opportunity to de-risk these projects, um, especially for the capital markets or for investors, because then when it comes to raising funding, um, we're not just raising it for a single point asset, but we're raising it across a portfolio of assets. And um, there's a lot of work to try and aggregate these assets. But at the end of the day, I think aggregation helps to mitigate that risk. Um, the likelihood of, you know, of a hurricane taking out all of the assets <laughs> across an island is, is far less than um, significant damage to a single point of distribution and generation. And we have been speaking of resilience. So we would like you to describe your vision of a resilient Caribbean community in which energy is of course at the center of the lives of its citizens. Ms. Griffith Tanghal, what would the electric utility look like and how would they function within the energy ecosystem of the future, which you envision? I think about the utility of the future and, and, I, and I think about it in three buckets. I think really for me, it's built on three primary principles. Um, the first one is disruption. The second one is digitalization. And the third one is decarbonization. Um, in relation to disruption, I really believe in the concept of disrupting yourself rather than waiting to be disrupted. I think for us at Lighting Power, there are a number of things that we did. And very early on, um, more than a decade ago, we would have looked at this and, and recognized there are things we need to do. So we were um, in Barbados, we would have developed and if, if one of the first utility scale solar PV systems in the Eastern Caribbean. And, it, and we've also in install utility um, scale battery storage in, in our, at our solar plant, just to understand the technology. We were very early in terms of being an EV adopter. We have the largest EV fleet on the island currently, um, you know, and making significant strides in investing in grid modernization. I think that's going to be a game changer when, you know, when I talk about digitalization. I think a lot of the activity there in terms of digitalization comes with that grid modernization and those things that we do. So we started by um, using our advanced metering infrastructure as um, our foundation. We've um, also employed, you know, distribution automation. We have a geographic information system that we've installed as well. And then finally for decarbonization, again, 
it's some of what I mentioned before. It's really looking at your energy mix, mix going forward. And it's a fuels, the asset strategy, the money that you would traditionally spend on fuel, you know, redeploy that and use it in building out um, assets that don't need that input of fuel. It might be intermittent renewables, um, but it might be other things as well. I, th I think I heard the professor saying also being smart enough to know that maybe 100% renewable sounds good, but it's not realistic. Maybe building in other types of fuels, like bio, um, you know, biofuels, um, need to be part of the mix as well. And I think the utility is well placed to guide on some of those decisions that can really help um, lead in the sector. And finally, um, I think the utility can play a role in terms of turning up in other sectors. So we begin to talk about transportation there with a the good professor. And I think there are other areas like agriculture, tourism, uh, waste management, where I think, you know, energy is converging with these other areas. And I think the utility um, is full of, you know, experts who can really help other um, sectors decarbonize. And that's really the game changer because we're just one small sector, but there are other sectors that need to be studied so that it's a holistic approach um, for our islands. And so thank you for that. And part of what you said, Ms. Sangho, leads to our next question. Ms. Rainford, how could this be financed and what role could the regional capital markets really play? Um, so, look, if, just to follow what the other panelists were saying to how to finance it, I think it depends on what part of the financing. I mean, clearly, with the utility, they have their own capital markets and they may have their own balance sheet that they may want to use to finance these changes. Um, I think what's interesting um, in terms of the decentralization of the market is that the customers themselves, as they look to invest in the generating assets, are going to have to look from financing in some in some shape or form. And that financing can come from, whether it's from commercial banks, which I think, again, across the region, the level of underwriting is, is, is quite different. There are some countries, and I will give a call out to Barbados. I think Barbados is one of the more progressive ones where they can look at the, the installations themselves as collateral and security for the financing. Um, there are other markets which, where they still do not do that. And so it puts the burden on customers to either find the capital themselves or to put some other form of security um, to, to underwrite that, that lending, as it were. And so I think in terms of the way that the, the capital markets can help, it would be to, to, to look at the risk, look at the customer risk and, and find a way to, to facilitate their ability to make investments into these, into these um, developments. The, um, the changes themselves are quite broad. And so I think the other element is how do you recoup, what's the benefit of each change? Because ultimately, if you make an investment, you kind of almost start from the beginning, where is the funding going to come from to repay that investment plus the return? And so you know, governments play a role in that regard um, with regards to setting, whether it's tariff programs, you know, whether it's a feed-in tariff, or if there's a way in which they can say, look, if you invest, then you will get paid X, whether it's by the utility or it's by the customer. And so that, that kind of almost needs to be a starting point before you can then devise the right security um, to finance to finance the investment. Some things that we're starting to see are elements such as green bonds, which I think is kind of a, a, a catch word for, for many things, uh, whether it's a company issuing it or funds issuing it. There are increased uh, renewable energy funds, which have private capital. I think the other market which or investor, which is really interesting, would be the insurance companies themselves or pension funds, as we've found in, in, in Jamaica. Um, a lot of the insurance companies sit on what they call the float, which is a very large balance of funding that they, they do look typically to invest. And I think as we can de-risk these projects, um, those are funds that should to some degree be mobilized. And again, I, I like the idea of those funds being local capital that we can invest in our own infrastructure. Um, so I would, just, I would just put that out there. I mean, there's obviously a lot of changes. So you kind of almost have to choose the right tool for the job. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the ability to to underwrite something where you know the security is there and the credit worthiness is there, whether it's from the customer's pers perspective or from the utility, that's really key um, to getting the financing. Thank you. So how should we reconcile and perhaps couple the focus on global climate action, especially the nationally determined contributions 
and other commitments under the Paris Agreement with regional and national energy goals that have energy security, resilience and cost at their center so that the vision of a resilient Caribbean community can be achieved within a low carbon or perhaps carbon neutral world. Professor Sharma. I am all for non-polluting things, but one of the parameters or many of the parameters which are utilized to grade us are parameters which are taken from countries where you don't have the homogeneity that we have here. For instance, let's assume that I were to put up a photovoltaic system, big photovoltaic system, and I do like Barbados, and I say, okay, I want to be 100%, and I go to photovoltaic and win, okay? And one of the things we know is, okay, I, I blend my system with that, and then I'm a small island, no matter how big we think, is, think we are, we are very small, and we have a cloud cover. And what happens? I lose all my photovoltaics because the cloud cover covers the island. When you look at parameters which are given to us, it is for continents. And there's no cloud that will cover the whole continent. So usually it is because there is some uh, backup that they can get from somewhere. Similarly with wind, if the wind stop blowing in from the easterlies from up for us, the whole island has no wind. <laughs> so you have to be very careful when you talk about 100% renewable when you're in an island that has no hydro. So I, one of the things I think we need to do before we go to, a, to this carbon requirement, which I agree that we should go to in terms of reducing our carbon footprint, is that we must have local experts review many of the things that we think, think we want to do and see whether it is not going to, whether it's going to redound to the benefit for us or it's going to cause much more pain in the sense that it's going to be very expensive it's going to be unreliable and it might work for resilience but it's not going to work for reliability however we can do it and like i said we can do it up to a point and we should know what that point is and therefore we aim to that point a hundred percent is not the point Okay, I'm going to say that flat. Um, it's that's unrealistic. So, what we need to do is first find out where our limits are in each island. It's different for every island, and work towards that. And there's if we look at the carbon output for most of the islands which are not industrialized, so not Trinidad, okay, or and wouldn't be Guyana in in the future. Let's look at the islands which are not very industrialized, which are the smaller states one of the largest output in terms of carbon output is from the transportation sector and this is where we should be focusing a lot of not just on the electricity sector because the electricity sector if you look at what has happened internationally most of the reduction of the carbon output reduction in many first world countries if i back out hydro from their system has nothing to do not much to do with photovoltaics and wind you know it had to do with moving from coal to natural gas. Coal to natural gas. That's a 50% reduction right there. And in certain countries in, in Europe, like France, it is going to nuclear, the nuclear option. Uh, if you look at, it, at Costa Rica, it's hydro, right? So we have to know what is, what is, what is relevant to our, our particular state and how do we work with that in our carbon reduction strategy. We need proper in-house calculations if you can't get it in-house then the caribbean community should get together so that in the caribbean community there are people we can go to to do it but by just contracting this out all the time which most utilities do and it becomes even worse when the utilities are now privately owned i think people have to understand privately owned utility has like any business the utility is a business, and there is one primary function of a business, shareholder value, increasing shareholder value. And yep, do not forget about that. That's what they are in the business for, to increase shareholder value. Okay, and that many times uh, is really not in line with the customer. Okay, when it comes to a utility, but many times it's not in line. So. 
that's what I, I, I will have to say so far. Thank you, Professor Sharma. Ms. Griffith Tanghal? So I was going to say that maybe Professor wants to put me out of business and put me out of a job. <laughs> by his statements, but no, I, I understand completely where he's coming from. Um, I'd like to think that I'm part of a utility that is quite different. And I think when I, when I think about your question, you know, and coupling the focus of the, the global climate action and the NDCs and the Paris Agreement initiatives with our regional um, and national goals, I, 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 have, I do agree with some of what um, professor said. I think we have to be quite practical. Um, I think we have to be realistic. I think we have to understand that we live in micro economies. We live on very small islands. And I think we have then to ensure that we have a very co coordinated and staged and phased and tailored approach as we move towards these ambitious targets that policymakers have set. And so I think that the energy experts, uh, particularly in the utility, need to sit down with the policymakers and maybe ask some hard questions. And I think then um, you have to define, when you set a target like 100% renewable energy by 2030, what does that mean? Does it mean a complete reliance on electricity being produced by 100% of renew renewable energy? Um, do the policymakers understand that a lot of the renewable energy that um, we will install is intermittent capacity and not firm? It doesn't look firm like what exists today with the fo fossil fuel um, you know, that we have installed. I mean, it's understanding things like that that help determine and 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 define what the targets really ought to be. I think as well um, for us in Barbados, and it looks very different, I think, for maybe Trinidad and other islands, but for us, a huge incentive to move towards more renewable energy, our reliance on renewable energy is um, we are subject to the vagaries of the international fossil fuel markets. And, um, and that can cause shock to customers. We've seen time and time again when the price of fuel jumps up. And it's really about, you know, our ability as we transition as well to bring more stability to the cost of electricity. Definitely. And Ms. Rainford, how should we reconcile and couple the focus on global climate action so that the vision of a resilient Caribbean community can be achieved within a low carbon world? I look, I actually like when when targets are super ambitious. That's just my personal preference. Um, reason being is because I think there's an old saying where, you know, if you reach beyond the stars and maybe you might just land amongst them. Um, so I, I clearly some of these statements are on the basis of policy or they may be government trying to drive um, votes and get people all excited, but it sets a vision. And I think that vision can start to get people aligned and ambitious targets, you know, if you said, Oh, let's just add another two percent to the to the existing generation. I just I just don't think that would drive change the way that an ambitious target of a hundred percent does. Um, and I agree with what the other panelists will. I agree to some extent. I think. Don't worry, Kim. You're not the only one out of a job from from Professor Sharma. Um, I think one of the one challenge what that I have to answer that question is effectively the technology, especially on the energy side, is changing so quickly and particularly in energy storage and battery technology that that vision for the next 10 years i i hesitate to say it's not possible because it may very well be once things have changed maybe it's not 10 years maybe it's 15 but i would like to believe you know as a developer and i am working on these projects trying to find as many energy projects that we can make economically viable to deploy i would like to believe that the more there are you know whether it's people like myself or the other panelists on, on, on today's discussion, um, not just in our region, but internationally, because at the end of the day, a lot of what's going to drive these prices and technological change is coming from other markets, you know, particularly out of Asia and China. So I, I, whilst I, I do agree that the targets are ambitious, um, I would never be dis, you know, discourage anyone to meet, whether it's the Paris Agreement or the COP Act, clearly it needs to be right size and fit 
for what we can do in the Caribbean so that it benefits us as well. Because the reality is a lot of the challenges that we face globally from climate change wasn't necessarily created by us either. And the, the groups who are now dictating what we should do, they have already enjoyed their industrial revolution. They've used coal for so many years. Now they're making money off of natural gas, so they're trying to change things. But we're, we're kind of falling in the wave of what they want to do. And there are not necessarily, you know, and there's not necessarily full alignment of those goals. And we're at different stages of our development process. So I would just, that would be my, my addition to the, the points already made. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our panelists, Professor Sharma, Ms. Griffith Tang Hao, and Ms. Rainford for sharing so many valid points with us today for the creation of a resilient energy future. It's discussions like this one that shows that the region is truly on the move in the journey of resilience through its renewable energy and energy efficiency programs. Here's a quick look at some of the initiatives taking place across the Caribbean. And don't go away because when we return, we answer your questions live. Stay with us. With several projects already underway, over the next two years in collaboration with partners and in partnership with governments, we will continue the rapid implementation of integrated resource and resilience plans, strengthening the resilience of the power sector in Belize, Jamaica, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago and St. Lucia by diversifying the energy supply and ensuring reliable, affordable power delivery. The Policy and Regulations Help Desk and Integrated Utility Service Model providing technical assistance to member states, utilities and regulators to overcome barriers and advance the uptake of renewable energy services and improved energy efficiency. The Regional Energy Apprenticeship Program equipping the next generation of sustainable energy leaders with the capacity and tools to disrupt, innovate and lead us into our sustainable future. And launching soon, the Project Preparation Facility and the Credit Risk Abatement Facility, mobilizing millions of dollars to finance the region's energy transformation. The commissioning of the design of a regional emergency response program to provide emergency energy services, restoration, and recovery support to strengthen the region's ability to withstand climate shocks. A strategy on energy access in rural and hinterland areas, which will increase the quality and quantity of modern electricity services supplied to citizens in rural areas. Regional strategies and actions which focus on energy efficiency and electric vehicles, providing a roadmap for our countries to decarbonize and optimize their energy systems across multiple sectors. In collaboration with the Caribbean Examination Council, we are also working towards greening education and through the Regional Energy Apprenticeship Program, we are creating employment opportunities as part of our thrust to invest and expand our region's renewable energy human resource capital. And this is just a snapshot. As you can see, along with our partners, we are working on several policies, actions and initiatives that will empower and improve the livelihoods of all CARICOM citizens. Join us. Let us transform our Caribbean together. We answer your questions live right now.
And now we head into a live question and answer with our panelists. But please note one of our panelists, Ms. Angela Rainford, she had to leave unfortunately. So our current panelists are Dr. Dave Von Gardner, Ms. Kim Griffith Tanghao, and Professor Chandrabhan Sharma, as we promote dialogue on the current energy landscape within the Caribbean region. Remember, our theme for this year's CARICOM Energy Month is a resilient community energy at the center. So our questions should be focused around the theme. So let's get right into it. Our first question is for Ms. Griffith Tanghao, and that is, how will electricity customers bear the cost of transitioning to more renewable energy? Hi, thanks, um, David, for that question. So, I mean, at the end of the day, when you talk about how will they bear the cost, I think that, you know, this is a real question for policymakers and regulators as we really look at the transition and what it entails and what it will cost to do that. And that's where, you know, earlier I talked about phasing the transition and ensuring at every point that we make smart decisions because as micro economies, of course, cost is a considerable factor. I think that for customers at the end of the day, as the end users of the product, we have to ensure a degree of affordability in terms of that cost, particularly looking at groups like the vulnerable customers who might be lower income, as well as looking at maybe gender in the Caribbean, quite a few heads of households are women, and the, the transition then has to be balanced against the cost of for, to those customers. So in terms of how they will bear that cost, I think that, um, you know, Today, how we at the utility have think, thought about it, we do look when we structure our tariffs and rates, we looked at you know those particular customers I talked about and um, ensuring that the decisions we make currently, how those then factor into the cost that customers make. But I think the regulator will have to look at some flexible cost recovery mechanisms for the utility and the investors, but ensuring at the end of the day, as I said, that that balance occurs between the transition and what really realistically as small microeconomies we can afford to bear at the end of the day. Okay, thank you, Ms. Griffith Tanghal. We're gonna go straight into our second question. Now this question comes from Mr. Darcy Boyce. Dr. Gardner, you can respond to this one. The question reads, do we have enough equity capital in the region to meet the RE targets? If we do, how do we mobilize it into RE investments? I think you're on mute, Devin, because we can't hear. My apologies, <laughs> I forgot to mute. Okay, yeah. we can hear Sorry. you now. All right, great. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, let me thank um, Darcy, a former minister of government in Barbados for that question. He, of course, understands well the landscape. Um, the view is that um, the quantum of capital, of equity capital, definitely is sufficient to meet the targets in the region. If we were to look at what the targets are, we are talking about um, around three and a half gigawatts of renewable energy um, that would be implemented over the next 10 years to meet the 48% by 2027 um, targets that the region has set. And that, if you were to work that out on the back of an envelope, could be anything from around um, 12, million, um, 12 billion US to around 15 billion US dollars. Um, the, 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 the issue if it has not really been one of the amount of capitals per se. It has really been the, the type of capital and the, and the terms and conditions of the capital. I think, the, and Angela pointed it out in her um, presentation, that um, oftentimes you're not getting the capital that comes with the um, concessional terms or the, the, the kind of um, risk levels um, that make it affordable. Um, you know, a lot of investors, equity capital investors and other capital investors, private capital investors, uh, do see risk um, uh, as something that they have to charge for. Um, you know, risk doesn't come free. And when risk premiums are put on top of capitals many times, you find that um, the, the interest rates and the other terms and conditionalities are not the most feasible. Um, so what we have been trying to do 
is to find ways and means of reducing risk and to also find what you could call development capital, which come at more concessional rates that can mix with equity capital so that you have a better um, outcome of um, the type of capital and the type of terms and conditions which these capital come to the market with. So I just want to put, put to point out there that I don't think this is one of the amount of capital not being available, but one of the conditions and terms of the capital not necessarily be the kind which would make the um, investments um, affordable to us in the Caribbean landscape. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. Now, our next question comes from Davril Bola. He's saying, based on the comments made by the esteemed professor regarding unreliability of the RE resources, is there any headway or attention placed on energy storage techniques for the region? Well, so Bola has, has raised a very, very pertinent question. Um, in terms of energy storage, energy storage is very expensive depending on what you're going on. There are several types of energy storage that you have for the utility. You have batteries, which everyone knows about. There's, there are the mechanical storage like flywheels. Um, but what, what, one of the issues that you have with many of the storage systems is that the length of time that they have power available for you because they're very short term flywheels are very short term they're only for um, transients capacitors are the same thing only transients they can give you a, a small to uh, one minute for the most not even that long batteries can give you some time but as you increase the time frame of a battery from minutes to hours you're talking about huge costs one of the better storage system that i that is user utilized internationally would be pump storage um, however, pump storage presupposes you have the geography to do pump storage and invariably pump storage is utilized where you have a natural waterfall area where you can pump back water back up to the waterfall. Um, other areas are using, uh, we have had some research being done in terms of compressed air, but compressed air also requires you to have naturally occurring salt formation, salt caverns that you can put the air in so it would not escape out, which is the same thing like carbon captains and so forth. So it is very expensive. It's not that it doesn't exist. It exists. It's really the price you are willing to pay for it. And if I amortize that price over the life of the project, and let's say our project is 20, 25 years, and I, I amortize the price of the storage into that, and depending on what's the period of the storage that you're dealing with, you probably would get in terms of a backup, the envelope value where you probably might almost triple the, the cost of the electricity that you are producing. That's, that's one of the major issues in terms of the storage. And why uh, renewable energy uh, systems, and particularly where we're referring to uh, wind and solar, uh, are so... Um, difficult to control is because of the variability. And that's why you find in many uh, RE contracts, the PPA is what is important because the PPA is what makes it bankable. If I don't get a proper PPA, I cannot go to the, to the bankers and get any kind of funding because I need to see a secure cash stream. And that's why you see that in many of them, if you look at a lot of the, most of the photovoltaics contract, they sell not power, they sell kilowatt hours or megawatt hours because that's what they produce and it's a take or pay contract. So what it really means is that the existing utility is providing the backup in case this goes. And that backup is not priced into the formula for the renewable energy uh, customer, uh, not customer, supplier. And because it's not priced in the renewable energy uh, supplier, the actual cost that you are paying is really hidden. It's a hidden cost because you, all you are buying from them is kilowatt hours, when in fact what you want from them is reliable, dispatchable KVA. So if you are not providing the KVA, someone has to provide the VARs. And someone has to have those VARs on a system all the time. And someone has to have the kilowatt hour available also when these renewable energy systems go down. And that's where the battery backup comes in. 
However, they are extremely pricey at this time. And I believe that except for very large systems where I want to probably have a backup for a switching, switching changeover, let's say a minute or two, you, you will see them there. Um, however, for uh, a utility scale uh, in terms of pricing into the existing utility formula, once I go above, and I will, I'm going to hazard a guess here, let's say but once I go above what I would call a capacity factor of greater than about 20 to 30 percent, I am, I am going to see very large expenses being transferred back to the consumer who has to pay for it. The other issue that I want people to pay attention to is that many of the renewable energy, uh, what, I, what I would call it, enthusiasts, speak a lot about penetration level. I, I even see my, my friend uh, Devon is talking about penetration level. The issue is not penetration level. The issue is capacity factor. Because capacity factor is what really gives you the power. Penetration level is just a mathematical division. It's really a penetration factor. So what I would suggest a lot of people to get back to is find out what's the penetration factor. That is the important factor. And that is what causes the issues in your power system and your pricing. So I hope in a nutshell I, put, I have put this clearly. So over to you, um, moderator. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Our next question, to what extent are renewable energy engineering studies provided and integrated in regional academic institutions? Dr. Well, maybe Sharma, I should go, go with that. I will, maybe yes, I should go. Yes. Yeah, I should. Well, you go first. You go first. Please. Yes. Yeah. I wasn't the, expecting that you would want a lawyer to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I will. I will try to answer. It. Okay. In terms of uh, a renewable energy integration, in terms of the studies, the only difference between a renewable energy study and a normal power study is the modeling of the renewable energy system that you are using. So, what I can say off the bat is that at the university, we have been doing this for a long time, which is power system modeling and power system analysis. We have done these for a lot of countries and we are doing it for, for TN Tech for the past 30, 40 years, we have been doing it. What is changing is how, how you model the intermittent photovoltaics and the wind system. Um, I didn't bring in uh, hydro because hydro is not really classified in terms of intermittability. Uh, hydro is a dispatchable resource. So once you have hydro, great, you're, you're very good off. Um, but wind and photovoltaics are the issues. And what you will find is that when you're doing the renewable energy integration studies or in terms of load flow, short circuit analysis, and stability analysis, the modeling becomes important. And then when you do those modeling studies, then you start to understand what are the consequences on the power system mean the other users of the power system, if one of those systems were to fail. But what is more important in the study is to find what penetration level and capacity factor would cause the power system to have a transient stability problem and maybe cause uh, power failure or cascading failures because you have lost too much energy in one shot. So we are doing it at the, at the Faculty of Engineering. We have been doing it all the time. Um, the only issue that you find, and, I'll, uh, and this is really not trying to sound a horn for us, is that as utilities become more and more privately owned, you find that most of the private uh, investors are coming from a first world country where they, in that country, the head office, has the capability of doing studies. And hence, most of the technical studies and private uh, power system uh, utilities in the Caribbean are done extra regional by the first world investor. Um, Trinidad is unique in that we still, 
still we are still still 100% locally owned as a utility, except we have some IPPs, um, and we still do all our studies. We have still have all our data. We we still are able to to understand locally everything that is happening. But what we have what we are doing here can be translated to any island once the island is willing to uh, supply the data. The issue you find is that if it's a private owned utility the actual data you require which would be the modeling or the models for your turbines and for your generators which are, which are all required for doing your analysis and also required for your regulators your regulators cannot regulate properly if they don't know these models um, and these data points are held very closely by private utilities and they only supply to their head office so that's where the, the, the issue really lies, not at the university, because the university has been doing this. As a matter of fact, if you do a very global search uh, anyway on IEEE Explore or any of them, and you see, look at studies in the Caribbean, you will see the, the University of the West, the Faculty of Engineering, have published a lot in terms of utility studies, in terms of uh, penetration levels for wind and photovoltaics. Uh, I, I think that is, uh, I'll wrap up there for that. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Professor Sharma. Now, our last question comes from Kathleen Riviere for Dr. Gardner. We have Barbados with ambitious RE targets of 100% by 2030. How do we get other countries to set any or stretch RE targets despite all countries signing agreements at the CARICOM level? Dr. Gardner? Yeah, thank you very much, Kathleen, um, our good colleague from UCR, uh, the, uh, the organization of um, Caribbean Utility Regulators. Um, we are embarked on have seen on a program called Integrated Resource and Resilience Planning. And um, Professor Sharma said it earlier, you know, in one of his um, dis the discussion points, the world is being able to know um, to a large extent what your system um, requirements are to deliver the energy services that you, you you need for your economic and social function. So what you are doing through this integrated resilience and uh, and res resource and resilience planning is to work countries um, individually to really understand what is their resource base for producing energy, um, especially electricity. Um, looking at conventional for those who have conventional resources like trinidad and no guyana and suriname um for meaning fossils like oil and gas i'm um, looking at the non-conventionals like the wind and solar and some countries which have geothermal and the hydro and understand what would be the optimal contribution of those various resources to um the energy system um especially for electric over the different time scales so we understand in five, in three years, in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 25 year cuts, what this mix could look like, um, given different growth trajectory project projections and um, and um, to see really how much of that balance would be best uh, provided from renewables, both in terms of the cost efficiency, the resilience aspect and features, the reliability features, and most importantly, to understand what it is that the society is prepared to accept in terms of those parameters, because ultimately it's really looking at the different scenarios and being able to say to um, the regulator, the ministry responsible for energy planning, the electric utility, and of course to um, other key stakeholders in the countries, here are the different pathways that you could take to achieving different percentages of renewable penetration in your electricity system, um, including maybe 100% um, penetration scenarios. Um, this is what it would cost and this is the kind of reliability that you would get and from, um, from, from the various scenarios. And of course, the kind of resilience features that this scenario will provide and provide them with the different in, um, levels of information around the scenarios and have the citizens um, make those decisions together at the level of government, utility regulator and the utility and of course other key stakeholders in an inclusive fashion. So that at the end of the day, we are getting to those um, targets um, not just through um, pie in the sky approaches, but really through some systematic uh, mathematical analysis uh, that provides guidance in terms of um, what the various options are for targets to be um, identified and then eventually implemented because targets are only going to be important if, you, if they are implementable. 
So we are doing work to support the countries in that regard. And we are now working with um, Belize and um, Guyana and um, Jamaica and St. Lucia and Trinidad and Tobago in doing this body of work. And we are planning to do that kind of work with the countries in the region who have not yet started doing so. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Gardner. And that Hi. brings us to the end of our live. I just wanted to respond quickly to, to the question that was posed by um, Professor Sharma. I wanted to share that. So our, our company is an investor owned utility. And in relation to, I know a lot of the engineering studies that are done, we would typically work with um, external consultants, but the staff that we have, they're quite knowledgeable and um, they are experts in their own field and they're local, right? They work for the utility and they're local and they understand the local context. And to a large extent, their input into those studies shapes the outcome that of those studies and really what is appropriate for for our island and for our environment and so i didn't want um you know persons here listening for them to go away with the impression that for an investor on utility and as as he said as Char professor sharma shared maybe owned by persons who um you know are not in the region so we're canadian owned it doesn't take away though from the fact that within the utility there are quite a number of very skilled engineers and, and other staff who work collect collectively to ensure that the outcome of those studies um, that are done uh, do reflect, as I said, what is appropriate and right sized for us in our, in our island. So I wanted to share that before we wrapped up. Let me answer that. Uh, I think you missed the whole issue here. The issue is not that you don't have competence in your, in your utility. The issue is that the regulator must be competent in what he's doing, and not the regulator. And for the regulator to be competent, the regulator must have all the information that the utility has. All. As the regulator is relying on what you are telling them as the truth. The regulator must be an independent body which has all the information and can do all the equivalent studies that you are doing to point out whether you are doing something correct or not, whether your cost factors are correct or not, or whether you are, are fabricating things. The, the, the issue is not whether you have competence in your in your utility. It's what the regulator has. And a regulator in, in, a, in a country serves a very important point. The regulator is the only, is only person or the only group that looks after the interests of the country and the interests of the citizen. If you ask, for a rate increase. How does the regulator know whether you are using your, your finances efficiently to, to deliver electricity? How does the regulator know that you want to put in 50 megawatts again? Why should it be 50 megawatts? What, couldn't it be 10 megawatts? Could it be that you, 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 you reduce some of your, your, your system? The only way a regulator can do that is he must have all the information that you have. And that's where the issue really lies, at the regulation level where how much information the utilities are giving the local regulators, one, and two, are the local regulators staffed by competent people who can discuss one-to-one, -one, manus manus, as we say in Trinidad, with the utility people, because there must be equivalent kind of level in terms of understanding, and can really come up with a proper position in terms of, okay, what you want, I agree. What you want? No, I disagree. And I can show you why I disagree because my analysis is showing X, Y, and Z. And what you, you could argue that. That's where the issue is. It has nothing to do with the utility. So I agree with Professor Sharma. And you know, Professor Sharma, I worked um, in our regulator in Barbados for over 13 years. And I am confident, and regulation is not new to Barbados. You know, our regulator, the Fair Trading Commission, the predecessor was the Public Utilities Board. And for us, you know, regulation of the electricity um, industry and sector, that started back in the 1950s. And so I've seen really a real development in terms of the sophistication of the regulator here on the ground in Barbados. I agree with you, that's not always the case maybe across the region in other jurisdictions but of course i can only talk about 
um, what I know, which is here in Barbados. And for us at Utility, we've recognized that a lot of key decisions that the regulator does make, we do agree, I do agree with you, are very much hinged on what they, what information they have. And for us, we try to be as transparent and have full disclosure as possible. A lot of it as well is set down in our legislation in terms of what we must share with the regulator to ensure that, ensure that sufficient information is given to the regulator. And a lot of those studies that we talked about, the regulator, um, you know, at the end of the day, they have sight of these studies. And we do also, you know, share under confidential cover, even information that we don't want widely shared in the rest of the market, that is shared with the regulator. Because I do understand what you're saying. They do need sufficient information to make decisions. And, and in terms of their ability to have skilled staff who can make wise decisions and sound decisions, uh, there is a requirement as well in our law that in, enables our regulator to work with consultants where they believe that they do not have those skills inside the regulatory agency. And I have seen time and time again where our regulator has you know, it, it effectively activated that and reached out and they do work with quite skilled consultants. So I think you made very good points there. And, um, you know, I just wanted to come in and reinforce that, you know, what you were saying and just to, you know, if there were any, um, you know, I, I was hearing it differently, but I, I understand what you're saying. And I just wanted to, to share our experience and how that, how that works here. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those points, Ms. Griffith. Tang Hao. I must say we had some well thought out questions sent in and I'm certain our panelists think the same. But that brings us to the end of our live question and answer for the regional launch of CARICOM Energy Month. Thank you so much for being a part of the virtual launch. A special thanks to all of our panelists and of course those persons who sent in their questions. We had so many questions, so we hope to address them in upcoming events for CARICOM Energy Month. Members of the media, you can join us in the media room to pose your questions to the Secretariat. Just before we go, um, our, our remainder of activities for CARICOM Energy Month, they include Cree's board meeting today and tomorrow, the Youth Energy Seminar on November 4th, Cree's board meeting November 5th and 6th, Solar Cooling Training November 9th and 10th, CARICOM Energy Month Webinar 1, Hydrogen on November 11th, the Regional Energy Dialogue Series November 16th to 19th, launch of the project preparation facility on November 25th and the CEM webinar 2 on November 27th. Remember, we are CARICOM Energy, building the foundation for resilience, clean and efficient energy future. Thank you so much.